church. But now we find in verse 4, it's almost as if there's a pause. Redemption, retribution, and then it seems for a moment there's contemplation. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, uh, they actually are saying, if there was no redemption, if there was no retribution, the fourth hallelujah, he reigns just in who he is. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy to receive all honor and glory and power. So today I want to show you that he is worthy of this hallelujah of realizing his regality, his royalness. Now, the only thing I've ever experienced anything close to what's going on here in Revelation chapter 19 was one time when I was stopping over from the Middle East in London and I watched the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. Now, I never got even a glimpse of Queen Elizabeth. I went as far as I could at the gate, but they closed the gates in my face. There was nothing special about me in any sense of the word that would allow me access or entrance into Buckingham Palace. But the changing of the guard, I'm telling you, it was impressive. Those big black horses and those men riding those horses decked out in red and those big tall black furry hats that they had on, all of them in unison, all of them synchronized, all of them in conformity. I'm telling you, that's the closest thing I've ever gotten on earth to the event that is happening in heaven. But one day, praise His name, because I am a blood-bought child of God, I'm going to be able to raise up on my tiptoes and say, I'm here and I'm going to experience the splendor and the magnificence of just realizing His regality of how royal He really is. Now here in verse 4, let's identify who are the four and twenty elders and who are the four beasts. Well, to understand, we have to go back to the first time that they are mentioned in the Revelation, the apocalypse, or the unveiling of Jesus in all of His glory, Revelation chapter 4. And turn with me there, and let's make an identification of these four and twenty elders and the four beasts. And listen to what he says here in Revelation 4, beginning at verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things to come, and I will show you the things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, to understand who these are, hold your place for just a moment right here in Revelation chapter 4. And turn with me over to the words of our wonderful Lord in the book of Matthew chapter 19. And I want you to see what Jesus says beginning there at verse 28 of the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew. And here we find that His disciples, His apostles, they were murmuring they were grumbling. They were talking about all the sacrifices that they had made to follow Him. And Jesus was assuring them that it, they would be rewarded, that God knows all about it, and God has never robbed any man. And whatever you give up to follow the Lord, He's going to give you something far better in return. And so listen to what He says in verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one of you that have forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. 
But many of them that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now we know who the twelve are, or at least half of the twenty-four, because he assures his apostles that they're going to sit on twelve thrones, and they're going to judge the representatives of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, I think that every Bible scholar would formulate it in this very same method that I'm doing right here. Now, when we think about the 12 tribes of Israel and a representative from each one of the tribes, we want to think about the 12 sons of Jacob. And I don't know how many of you could name three of those that were the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. I don't know if you could name two. Don't know for a surety. That's one reason we have Gateway Christian School. And I can go down there for chapel, first through fourth graders, and I say, can y'all name me who the heads of are of the 12 tribes of Israel? And it doesn't take them long at all. And they've got all 12 of them named. You'd say, Pastor, what difference does it make? Well, we need to understand the priestly tribe, the Arianic order, the tribe of Levi, and we certainly need to understand the kingly tribe, which is the tribe of Judah, and to understand that Jesus was made after an order higher than the Levitical order and the Arianic order. He's after the order of Melchizedek. I don't have time for all that. A priest that lives forever and ever without beginning or ending. And then we certainly need to see that even in his earthly heritage, on his mother and father's side both, he is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And on his father's side, his biological father, he's king of kings and lord of all lords. So it's kind of important to know a little bit about these tribes. Now, when it comes to the sons of Jacob, I don't like all of them, do you? Just read about what they did to their little brother Joseph. And I tell you, when you find out what they did to their little brother Joseph, surely it's not going to be those 12 guys. Um, uh, well, I better hesitate. I'm not sure that they've all been regenerated. Some of them seemingly got right uh, near the end, somewhere along the way. And Jesus said, you followed me in this regeneration. And I'm glad that I've been regenerated. My first birth was to Adam, and all the way back to Adam, I'll die. My second birth was to Jesus, and he is the last Adam, and in Jesus, I'll live. I'm following him in this regeneration. But let's think about it this way. Let's think about God choosing as the representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel, the very best of the Old Testament, representing each one of the tribes. Let's think about God choosing Abraham is there. Let's think about God choosing Moses is there. Let's think about God choosing that Joseph is there. Let's think about God choosing that David is there. Let's think about God choosing that Elijah is there, and Elisha is there, and Jeremiah is there, and the last of the Old Testament prophets that would prophesy in the New Testament dispensation was John the Baptist. Now, when I get a picture of those 12 men gathered around there and the 12 apostles, but go back again to verse 28 and pick out that word and listen to what he said to his apostles, you're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I can't wait to get there and to hear this conversation that is going on between the 4 and 28 elders. Because this word judging, it means to contemplate. It means to consider. It means to weigh the evidence. It means to come up with a sure and a certain verdict that everyone can agree on. It's kind of like the two on the road to Emmaus. And they thought all hope was lost. And Jesus came along and joined them and he was withholding from them. He was incognito. And they were sad of heart. And Jesus said, why are you so sad? And they said, we thought that he was the one. And now it's the third day since he's been crucified. And Jesus opened up the scripture. And he began with Moses. And he went all the way through the Old Testament and he expounded upon the things from the Old Testament prophets concerning himself. Wouldn't you like to have that message on CD? Wouldn't you like to hear that over and over again? And so here 
here they are, the 12 apostles, and they're verifying what they knew in the Old Testament. And these Old Testament saints are giving the word again from the Old Testament. And David's coming to a greater understanding of the Messianic Psalms that God gave him to write. And Elijah and Elisha, they're seeing that Jesus is the wheel within the wheel. And they're seeing that everything turns and revolves around him. And they're coming up with the verdict over and over again. The apostles are assured. And the 12 tribes of Israel, the representatives, they are assured. And when they look over and they see Jesus on the throne in all of his glory, they have to cry, this is the one. We've contemplated it. We've considered again. The evidence is absolutely irrefutable. And together, we 24, we're not telling you what to do. The only thing we do is give you a scent and adoration. And we say, amen, so be it. Everything you've done and will do and are doing, it's good all together, amen. And in you and in you alone, you are worthy of hallelujah, hallelujah. So, so first of all, we see that it's the four and 20 elders. If they're crying hallelujah today, well, let's try it one time. You might join into heaven for a moment. But now notice that when John heard the voice that said, come up hither, to be able to understand it, he was in the Spirit. <laughs> oh, and the carnal mind cannot receive the spiritual things because they are spiritually discerned. I left you out, it'll help you. It'll cure your indigestion. It'll get your mind off your troubles. If you would just recognize for a moment what they recognize and just say, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But there's another group. Let's go back over there again to Revelation chapter 4 and listen to what he says in verse 4. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. This is just God's all-knowingness, every mind, every matter, every motive, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings. You'd say, Pastor, who are they? Who are they? I believe that they represent the four Gospels. And I think that I'm making the appropriate identification. Identification. The first beast had a face like a lion. And that represents the Gospel of Matthew. Because when Matthew writes his Gospel, he's writing to prove one perspective and one truth only, that Jesus is the King. And Matthew traces him back 14 generations and he verifies that he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's God in the flesh that has come to live among us. And he he identifies him as the king. And all kings in ancient times, they love to have those lions standing guard. And then when you see the beast with the face of a calf, that represents the gospel of Mark. And in the gospel of Mark, Jesus is the suffering servant. And a calf was to serve the family. And if a calf had to, in order to feed the family, the calf was such a servant that he would die. And then the face uh, there of a man. And that represents the doctor's gospel. That represents Luke. And he writes down the favorite phrase of Jesus in the gospel of Luke. And Jesus identifies himself as the son of man. Fully man, yet fully God. The flying eagle that has to be John. And his gospel is different from the other three. Because John is writing to prove one point and one point only that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And my God today, how blessed we are that in my hand, the four beasts that are there around the throne of God, I've got Matthew in my hand. I've got Mark in my hand. I've got Luke in my hand. I've got John in my hand. Not only do I have them in my hand, but I thank God that since a child, I have known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make me wise unto salvation 
salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. I've got these beasts in my heart and these beasts that are in my heart, they rage against the beast and the false prophet of the end time. I know that his word is real and his word is true and the gospels, they protect me in front of me. They protect me behind me. They're all around me. They're holding me up. I believe exactly what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has declared. Let them fly in heaven and declare his glory revealed us in the gospels. Look at verse 8. Listen to what he says in verse 8. And he said, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. It's been nearly 800 years now. And we hear this same song in Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple, and the smoke of His glory arose. And it was so moving that the posts of the temple, they were shaken out of their place. And I cried, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And he said, Lord, if I'll just be purified, if you can do something with me, I'm willing to go. And one of the seraphims flew, having six wings, and with two wings covered his feet, and with two wings covered his face, and with two wings he did fly. And he took the tongs and took a hot coal off of the altar of God and placed it on my lips and purged me. And then I cried, here am I. Oh, when the refrain came from the throne of God and the God said in the joint conference of the Trinity whom shall we send and who will go for us who's going to go in the name of the Father who's going to go in the name of the Son who's going to go under the power of the Holy Spirit Isaiah said here am I Lord send me my life has been changed I attended a funeral of a dead king but I saw the king that lives forever and forever I saw the rightful heir of the throne of Israel. And now, Lord, send me. I'm ready to go. Isaiah said, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And who will declare his generation? And Isaiah said, here am I. Here am I. Just a glimpse of the throne room of God would change everything about us. It didn't stop there. Look at verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and forever, and the four and twenty elders, they fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and forever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou has created all things for thy pleasure and they are and they were created revelation 4 they praise him for creation revelation 5 gets even sweeter when they search through heaven trying to find one worthy and john said i wept much because no one was found worthy to take the book and to loose the seals thereof one of the elders was it one of the four and twenty elders that laid his hand on John's shoulder and said, Weep not. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. He had prevailed to take the book and to loose the seals thereof. And then they sing worthy. Next time we sing it in church, maybe even today, Brother Howard, for invitation on him. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. I can't wait to see a rainbow that's emerald in its color. Won't that be something? A rainbow around the throne. God still signifying, kept my promise, didn't it, to Noah. I verified it in the bow. And now look at this bow around my throne. Creation is going to continue because I said it would. And the earth will serve God's purpose until God folds it up like an old garment. And then there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. Won't that be something? Now notice with me, we're going back to Revelation chapter 19. 
And they're saying hallelujah. They just pause for a moment between redemption and retribution and the fact that he reigns and they just realize again how regal, how royal, how wonderful he is. And Lord willing, I want to show you that he deserves a hallelujah because of the names and the titles that he bears. And there's nobody else in the world, don't care who it is, that can carry the names and the titles that Jesus does. And then I want to show you that they say hallelujah for the way that he looks and the way that he is dressed. And the way that he looks and the way that he is dressed, it matches what he's done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. My gracious, when I just think about those things, I find myself saying, hallelujah. I'm trusted in the one that bears titles and names that no one else can. I'm trusted in one that looks and is dressed like no one else can. I'm trusted in one that has done, is doing, and going to do what no one else can do. And I join in with the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, and I cry, holy, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou art worthy to receive the honor and the praise and the glory. Go back to Revelation 19 for just a moment and let me show you some of these names and titles. I'm enjoying myself. Of course, I love I loved, I loved talking about Jesus. I, I enjoy it. Look at verse 1. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and forever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now, We're going to get to that fourth one a little bit later on. He reigns and his bride has made herself ready. But turn with me to verse 11. The scene is set in heaven and now this is the end of the seven years of tribulation here on earth. And Jesus is coming back to the battle of Armageddon. And here we see it described beginning at verse 11. And remember now, this is at the end of the seven years of tribulation. It all begins with the unsealing of the seven seals in chapter 6. And the first thing that you see is a rider on a white horse. But he has no bow. He he has a bow but no arrows. And so it's going to be some type of military, political, economic genius that's going to come on the scene and he's not going to have his own army. He's going to use someone else's. And then you've got the red horse of war and the black horse of famine and then the pale horse of death. And it seems even now, and if today you were living in Iraq or Syria, if you were living over there in the Middle East, you would already have thought that the tribulation has begun. Dear friend, we've just seen a glimpse of what's going to happen on a worldwide scale. And even now, I can hear the hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They're ready to ride upon the earth. And God's going to fulfill his end time plan. And he's going to send this world into seven years of great tribulation for one purpose and one purpose only. Zechariah 12 and 10. And they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and recognize he's the only begotten son, the one and only sacrifice once and for all. His blood is the only way, only name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. Let that day happen. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord. And Jesus is worthy of having his own day that lasts forever and forever. And so now... In verse 11, he's coming to the battle of Armageddon. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, different than the white horse of Revelation 6. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is his comforting name. I'm thankful today that I can say that my Lord is faithful and true. Faithful describes his conduct and true describes his character. And his conduct and his character are one in the same. Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3, beginning at verse 22, great is thy faithfulness. We can hold on to the faithfulness of God. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, listen to 
to Paul, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Isaiah 42 tells us that Jesus is the chief steward. Eleazar was the chief steward of the household of Abraham. And when Abraham and Sarah were not able to bear a child for a season, Abraham thought about making his chief steward the heir of all things because he was unable to bear a son. But Jesus was the embodiment of the Godhead. Oh, dear friend, what a blessing to know this today, that the Godhead and the fullness of it dwelt in him bodily. You talk about a steward. He was the living, walking word of God. But in everything that he did, this wonderful steward of the household of faith, he came and was faithful in all things. Isaiah 42 says he won't even be discouraged. You think he was discouraged in Gethsemane. And people, they picture Gethsemane so it will suit us in the wrong way. Jesus wasn't trying to get out of dying on the cross. Don't you ever suggest that to me again to identify yourself with him. Jesus was about to die. His soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death. And what he was actually saying, if, if this cup can pass from me, Father, don't let me die here. I came to die on the cross, but if you want me to die here, I'll die here. But I came to fulfill it all and to cry out, it is finished. He's the perfect, obedient servant of God. True, true, true.